Okay, good morning to everybody. Thanks, uh, Francesco. Thanks, uh, Julien. And uh, thanks to all the organizing committee of this uh, event. Um, today I'm going to speak about Smart Brain, which is a partnering project within the HBP initiative. And uh, it's uh, a multidisciplinary project involving four groups in uh, three countries. So it involves my group from the University of Modena Reggio Emilia, the group of uh, Ludovico Silvestri from the LENS, the Laboratory of Nonlinear Spectroscopy, which is a uh, HBP member, and then involves the group of uh, Sylvain Reim in the Hospital of Lyon and the University of Lyon, and the group of uh, Raf van der Plas, who is here today from the University of Delft, and he's going to jump in, in the, in the, into the presentation to present uh, his, uh, his part of the, of the project. So these four groups are in charge of uh, collecting data, of uh, elaborating data, and uh, creating a computational model allowing to improve the performance of uh, imaging techniques and uh, optical imaging techniques, which is basically one of the uh, most uh, used and was most widely employed method to collect data from, uh, from brain research. As all of you know, uh, the data acquisition is uh, a crucial step in understanding brain physiology and brain pathology and to generate computational model of brain activity. And not only functional data, not electrophysiological data, but also morphological data. And optical microscopy is uh, used, uh, is maybe the most widely used method to collect morphological and structural data of uh, uh, neurons and circuits. But uh, despite the improving and the continu continuous development of uh, imaging modalities and imaging technique that allowed to uh, boost the research in neuroscience, every imaging modality has advantages and disadvantages. For instance, we can have different resolution. We can obtain very high resolution uh, acquisition of uh, neuron uh, structures or of, uh, synaptic uh, specificity of uh, dendrites. And for instance, we can obtain information about synaptic vesicles and uh, how they are distributed or they are released. And then some techniques can be applied to in vivo, other are poorly invasive, other are more invasive. Some techniques, unfortunately, destruct or completely destruct the, the, the tissue or maybe need some genetic modification in order to express some uh, fluorophores. And so imaging modalities have advantages and disadvantages. So it is not possible to obtain the, the perfect technology, the perfect methods to, to be applied to neuroscience research. Um, fortunately, the advent of uh, HPC, so high performance computing, provide the capability of, uh, let's say, combining some features extracted from one imaging modality in order to obtain information from other imaging modalities. So the, the, the advent of these uh, high performance computing has opened the, 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 the road to the integration of multiple spatial scales and multiple resolution uh, imaging to obtain information from uh, different uh, modalities and improve the, 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 the overall resolution of the system and the information that can be uh, extracted from uh, imaging. So computational algorithms have been developed to, to improve the morphological reconstruction, the anatomical reconstruction, to, to obtain some prediction of uh, the 
tissue and of the sample. Um, the fact is that brain morphology and uh, the, the information regarding morphology and, and anatomy is typically obtained through the histological or different histological procedures that cannot be directly correlated with clinical imaging data or most of the time cannot be correlated separately. So one group or uh, one time you acquire uh, neural, new, neuronal morphology instead of uh, uh, synaptic morphology or circuit morphology and then the, in, somehow you have to integrate the information coming from these different modalities. So the idea is to uh, use some data-driven algorithms to extract information from these different modalities and then create predictions of uh, these, uh, these structures and these, uh, these uh, anatomical data. Why we, we come to this, uh, this um, idea? So the idea is to make uh, a, 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 a univocal pipeline between uh, or among different techniques uh, that span from uh, a very, very high resolution, for instance, with electron microscopy, you can obtain information from, uh, here you can see synaptic vesicles, so the, 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 the resolution is a uh, few nanometers. But of course, with electron microscopy, you have to perform uh, very thin slices of the tissue, so you uh, somehow completely destroy the tissue. Then you can improve the resolution, uh, 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 I mean, not decrease the resolution, but you can have a larger field of view going to super resolution microscopy. So you have, let's say, 20 nanometers uh, or uh, 10, uh, 30 nanometer resolution with super resolution microscopy. You can clearly isolate synaptic uh, dendrites, boutons, or uh, uh, spines. But once again, you destroy the tissue because you have to perform very thin slices. Confocal microscopy has the same problem, so you have to make thin slices. You decrease a bit the resolution, so you go to hundreds of uh, nanometer. You can have larger field of view. You, you, you maybe can obtain uh, the, the isolation of different antibodies that are used to uh, load fluorophores, fluorophores into the tissue. But then you can apply uh, a, a different uh, variant of the confocal microscopy, which is the two-photon microscopy, and you load fluorophores directly into the uh, the, the, the for instance, the mouse model, and you acquire a large field of view. You can obtain, uh, let's say, 100 microns, uh, uh, 500 microns per 500 microns field of view with a resolution of a few hundreds of nanometers. And then, most importantly, you can obtain information in vivo. So you don't have to destroy the tissue. You don't have to create thin slices. You can keep your uh, tissue uh, compact and in many cases you can have uh, uh, live tissue so you can perform two photon microscopy in vivo. The last microscopy so you can hear that we have span three order of magnitudes and uh, uh, with light sheet microscopy you can obtain large field of view ideally you can have uh, the uh, the the information obtained from a uh, whole mouse brain, you have, unfortunately, to treat chemically the tissue because you have to perform what is called the clearing of the tissue. You have to replace the lipid uh, with uh, some particular, particular uh, contrast medium. So you have to uh, use a, a specific ind index of refraction in order to have the light coming from all the tissues, so the light have 
to has to pass throughout the whole tissue, sort of throughout all the brain. And in 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 this uh, in this uh, imaging modality, you can stain the old brain, for instance, the old mouse brain with a specific fluorophore. You can fluorophore. You can mark uh, uh, with a specific antibody and uh, and uh, the fluorophore attached to the, that antibody, and then you can make express one specific kind of cell. Here you can see Purkinje cell in, in the cerebellum. So this is a, a, a mouse cere cerebellum, which is marked with a specific antibody of the Purkinje cells. And the old brain is expressed. And with light sheet microscopy, with, uh, let's say, a few hours recording, you can obtain the expression of the, the, old, uh, the old brain uh, and, and collect it through this light sheet uh, uh, procedure with a resolution which can be variable, but it can go up to one micrometer or even less. So typically, these measurements are performed separately. So one time you perform light sheet. Then the other time you take another brain, you perform two photon. Then you take another brain, you perform confocal or electron microscopy. So the complementary measurements are performed separately with different uh, different specimens and different tissues. That in integration is performed generally manually because you have to, let's say, somehow integrate the information coming from one acquisition with the information coming with the other acquisition, and then you have to somehow register the coordinate space of uh, these different modalities. So our idea is to apply the method developed by the group of uh, Raf van der Plas, which is going to be explained in detail by, by him in a few minutes. And this uh, particular machine learning algorithm is called Image Fusion. It allowed, and it has been uh, demonstrated uh, on uh, a different uh, kind of uh, imaging uh, method. Um, our idea is to try to allow, to, to employ this uh, image fusion algorithm to integrate different optical microscopy technique to, to improve in, in a certain sense, sense the resolution of uh, one of the, the, the modalities. So in Smart Brain, we have applied uh, these uh, image, we, we, we aim to apply these uh, image fusion algorithm to three different modalities, which are the super resolution microscopy, the multi photo microscopy, and the light sheet microscopy. And we want to apply these, um, this image fusion to, uh, let's say, two types of samples. So the first type of sample is mouse, mouse tissue. Uh, in order to, let's say, calibrate and to better calibrate the algorithm. And the second part of the project is, uh, is uh, devoted to the application of the image fusion algorithm developed in the first part of the project to human samples collected from uh, patients suffering from uh, uh, pharmacoresistant uh, epilepsy, epilepsy. So we are taking, uh, taking um, stained sample from the neurobiobank of Lyon, um, temporal uh, lobe uh, tissues, and fresh, fresh tissues coming from the neurosurgery department in Unimore. So due to some uh, issues, uh, we had to reorganize the project. So we have to, uh, let's say, rearrange the work packages. And instead of running serially, so starting from the brain mouse and developing and setting the, the algorithm, we decided to, let's say, collecting data, collecting data from mouse, uh, from mice, and from patients. And then in the, the last part, in the last year of the project, we are going to apply the, the image fusion algorithm to these data collections. So here I show you some examples of what we have collected up to now. And is in this fir first example, there's uh, an acquisition of um, a mouse brain, which has been uh, perfused uh, with a solution containing rhodamine conjugated with uh, dextrin, which specifically stains 
um, blood vessels. So this is an acquisition of a whole brain mouse showing through light sheet microscopy brain vessels. And the resolution is 1.5, 1.5, XYZ, 3 micrometer XY and 3 micrometers in the Z, uh, in Z axis. And uh, the same uh, image, images has been stuck, and this is the mouse, I mean, this is just a, a half uh, brain. This is the reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of the images that, that, that has been acquired in the, and showed in the previous slides. Slide. Here you can see a whole brain this time, so it's not uh, half of the brain. But this time, the light sheet microscopy has been performed on a brain of a mouse, which has been uh, um, fixed and stained with a neuronal marker expressing a synapsin antibody. So, uh, uh, an antibody that specifically mark all neuronal bodies. So here you can see the cerebellum, lots of brain neurons. And here in the rest of the, of the brain, you can see small spots representing neuronal bodies. And here again, the resolution is 1.5, 1.5, and 3 micrometers x, y, z axis. Here again, uh, one uh, different uh, representation of a half brain of a mouse reconstructed in 3D, and is, uh, here you can see the rotation with the distribution, different distribution of neuronal bodies. But of course, here we have, uh, uh, let's say, good resolution, but not optimal resolution in order to, for instance, follow dendrites, follow axons, or follow uh, neurites in details, so we cannot perform any kind of connectomes uh, studies and uh, nothing that can be so specific in order to reconstruct circuit, circuit architectures, for instance. Here, I show you the resolution of the system. So here uh, you can see in, in details that neuronal bodies can be isolated and imaged. The same light sheet uh, microscopy acquisition has been uh, performed on uh, human samples. So human tissues, these are human uh, tissues coming from the neurobiobank, so these are fixed tissue, so are not fresh tissues, uh, stained with uh, eosin, which is a non-specific uh, fluorophore, which uh, does not actually mark specifically some kind of some kind of neuronal bodies. So this enters and is. Uh, taken by all cell uh, specifically. And here you can see the distribution of eosin into the, uh, the, the human sample with a resolution of, once again, 1.5, 1.53 micrometers. So you can see all the neuronal bodies. And these are blood vessels with small red uh, blood cells. This is uh, another light sheet microscopy acquisition of a human brain cleared and stained with eosin. And this is a fresh sample. And uh, I should have uh, a reconstruction, a 3D reconstruction of single cells. Here you can see single neurons and uh, a blood vessel here you can see, with small red blood cells inside. We performed the same acquisition, I mean, at, at the acquisition through multiphoto microscopy on the same tissues. So here I, I'll skip and I will show you uh, quickly in order to give the floor to, to Raf, which will 
uh, who will uh, explain more in detail the image fusion algorithm and what can be performed. But the idea is that the same tissue could be acquired, it could be imaged through different techniques. So here you can see what we have shown in the previous slides. So mouse brain stained with dextran conjugated rhodamine. So we can image with a high resolution with a higher resolution compared to light sheet microscopy blood vessels of mouse. So the resolution here is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, one micrometer X, Y, Z axis. So it's, let's say, three times of the light sheet microscopy resolution. Once again, the same thing. So here is another type of animation performed by Raf um, of uh, mouse brain. So here you can see blood vessels more in detail. But the same thing has been performed on brain samples coming from human patients. So here you can see the autofluorescence uh, generated by neuronal bodies and acquired through the multiphoto microscopy at 0.5.5 wide micrometer resolution. So here's another animation of a small uh, sample, a small portion of human brain acquired through multiphoto microscopy. And uh, here is another type of visualization. So you can see small neuronal bodies which are autofluorescent and can be collected, this fluorescence through multiphoto microscopy. So uh, we are now going on with the project. We are uh, going to load all our data on the data and knowledge service of eBrains. So we are also uh, loading uh, papers on the live paper section of eBrains. And uh, we are going to generate some outcomes that will be loaded onto the eBrains. And uh, now I'll give the floor to, to Raf, who will explain more in detail the image fusion cross-model algorithm. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, my group is usually active on the US side in National Institutes of Health type uh, grants. And through Jonathan and, and eBrains and this, this HPP project is the first time we are making our making our feet wet on the European side. So quite excited about getting, uh, getting on on this. Um, in terms of uh, our work within the Smart Brain project, we'll, we'll focus primarily on, well, our group works on computational analysis of molecular imaging modalities in general. Um, this particular contribution is focused on the fusion work. So fusion is basically an exercise in having your cake and eating it too, because you have many modalities. And like Jonathan says, each one has their reason to exist. It has its own advantage, its own disadvantages. And the fusion effort is a way to sort of computationally model the relationships between different imaging modalities and to use those models, if we can detect these relationships, to use those models in a predictive way so that you can have situations where you say, well, if you can show a data set where you have one modality reporting XYZ observations and you have another data set reporting another modality reporting other things about that same sample, after a while, if you have enough examples, you can start to see, well, there's mathematical relationships between it. The simplest one would be correlation. But most of the modalities, the intermodality relationships are more complex than just straight up univariate correlation. So fusion is an exercise in first discovering these, these connections. And once you have them encoded as a model, you can start to use them in creative ways. A simple example of this is, is shown in this, uh, this little um, uh, picture. So on the bottom left, you see an imaging mass spec uh, data set. It shows you the distribution of a lipid in the brain. This one has the mass 747. That's what that what that number means. Um, that imaging modality, imaging mass spectrometry, is basically using a mass spectrometer in a spatially specific way. So you just touch every pixel and you report what the mass is that you measure, what molecular content you find there. We're looking at the distribution of one lipid. Now, as you can see, the pixels are quite rough. Pixels are not very fine, so the spatial resolution is limited. However, the chemical specificity of that imaging modality is, is, is well, I'm biased, of course, but I, I think it's fantastic because it doesn't require any form of labeling beforehand. So you can see hundreds of molecules, thousands even in recent experiments, 
and there is no prior knowledge needed, so you don't need to label beforehand. So for exploratory purposes, imaging mass spectrometry is, is very, very nice to have around, but the downside is spatial resolution is not that great. Then you have something like microscopy, which is on the right-hand side. There's just straight up classical bright field um, h and &E stained microscopy, nothing specific. And that says it exactly there, nothing specific. Like it doesn't tell you which molecules are where, but it gives you a good lay of the land in terms of small spatial pictures, small pixel elements describing that same tissue area. So first the imaging mass spec was done, then the microscopy was done because the staining had to happen for it to be visible. Now, once you have those two data sets, Okay, then you can start to uh, go look for these relationships, and that's what the fusion process is about that is in that paper that you see at the bottom there. And what it tries to do is it tries to find these correlations, tries to model this, and then you can start to say things like, well, given the relationship that you see between the imaging mass spec at the bottom left and the microscopy on the right, can you tell me the prediction of, um, well, you have the microscopy at fine spatial resolution, you can start to predict what the observation of the imaging mass spec would be at that fine spatial resolution because you have those photon-based measurements at that fine spatial resolution. And then you get a prediction on the top left there. So what you see there in the top left is the fused image. The fused image is fully predicted, so that's not a measurement. However, it combines the advantages of the source modalities. So you start to have the spatial resolution of the microscopy and you have the chemical specificity, the lipid, uh, of the imaging mass spec. The price you pay for this, because uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, is that this is a prediction. So if you can do a measurement, by all means do a measurement, but predictions become interesting in those cases where it's not economical to do the measurement, or it's not practical to do the measurement because it would take, take too long, or it's infeasible because you can't get to that um, spatial resolution with an instrument you have available, something like that. So that's sort of the, the basic setup. Um, what I just described is an example of spatial sharpening. Spatial sharpening is predicting to a higher spatial resolution. Predictively trying to do some sort of super resolution stuff, but uh, driven by actual measurements just from another modality. Now, in terms of... Uh, the example I want to show you here, so within, within the Smart Brain project, we are going to, we are going to try to uh, fuse the light sheet microscopy, for example, with the STED, with the multi-photon uh, work. And at the moment, we are working on the registration. So before fusion can take place, you need to 3D register all these things so they're all in the same coordinate system. So that's what we're working on right now in the Smart Brain project. Now, that doesn't mean that on a parallel track we're also developing the fusion work forward. So what I want to show you is another application, not spatial sharpening, but something else called out of sample prediction, which is also based on that fusion process. And it's going to combine two modalities that are not part of Smart Brain, but that are part of our sort of uh, experimental uh, knowledge within our lab. The particular modalities I'll be showing you are Two types of mass spec based imaging. One is FTICR, that stands for Fourier Transform Ion Cyclotone Resonance. Doesn't matter what it is. The gist of it is imaging mass, two forms of imaging mass spec. The FTICR variety is um, probably the best in terms of chemical specificity. However, it's very expensive and it takes a long time, and the pixels are typically much larger. The time of flight imaging mass spectrometry goes much faster. You can collect the hundreds, millions, thousands of pixels, like millions of pixels for an experiment. However, its chemical specificity is less. So you have that same relationship as what I was just showing you, only in this case we have two modalities that are mass spec based, so ion based. Here's an example of this. So in the top panel you see FTICR based uh, molecular measurements. What we're looking at there is uh, again a lipid in a red brain section. Now, it's important to note that we only collected FTICR measurements on the right-hand side of that tissue, and it was collected at 100 micrometer pixel size. At the bottom, you see time of flight uh, measurements. They are collected for the entire tissue section because it's much cheaper, it's much faster. 
And this was done on a neighboring tissue section, so the next tissue section, two slices. What happens now is that we learn a model, we go find, uh, we, we discover basically the relationships, and you learn a model between FTICR observations and time of flight observations, and then you can say, well, you have the time of flight at 30 micron pixel size, predict me the FTICR observations at 30 micron pixel size. And then you get this, this panel here, and this panel has a couple things in it. On the right-hand side, you have an example. So we predict FTICR observations for this lipid at 30 microns. And what you get then is the right-hand side. That's just spatial upsampling, the example I just showed you before. We, because we had, on the right-hand side, FTICR and time of flight. But where it becomes more interesting is that we collect the time of flight also on the left-hand side. We don't have any FTICR measurements on the left-hand side. But if the data does not move to a weird uh, place. We can measure how similar it is to the training data that we had. We can start to use the model also in those locations and say, well, predict me the FTICR on the left-hand side where there was no FTICR measured. So out of sample prediction is basically an exercise in trying to predict in areas where only one of the modalities can be measured. And that becomes very interesting in those cases where one of the modalities is destructive and the other one is not destructive because then you can get ideas of what the destructive modality would have told you with a certain barrier of uncertainty around it, of course. Huh? And so these predictions already have statistical measures of performance here at the bottom. They're like in the 90 and the 80 percent. So we're pretty, pretty confident of this distribution. But of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So we actually collected FTICR measurements plain old measurements from a neighboring tissue section, and we, we did it for those areas in gray. And what you see then is here the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is measured, the left-hand side is predicted, and I would say we're arguably quite close to what the ground truth would have, pre would have reported. And then people will typically say, well, what, if you can collect the right-hand side, why do prediction at all? Well, that's where, where the details start uh, creeping in, because if you measure at 30 microns that tissue section I just showed you, that would take 122 hours of measurement time. The predicted version on the basis of time of flight takes 6.5 hours of measurement time. Is that important? Well, that depends on how much money you have, how much budget you have, how much resources there are, what your application is, whether you can live with the predictions. But you can see that prediction is often um, an option in cases where practical measurement is not really um, available to us. And that's more or less uh, what, it, what I wanted to show you. So some of this work will be directly translated also to the smart brain work. Um, but for the moment, we need to make sure that the registration has been sufficiently finely defined. And then we move on to this phase of the smart brain project for LSMs and for STET and for, um, I forgot the third one, STET, LSM, and Multiphoton, multi there you go. <laughs> And I think, well, yeah, that's for you to. Uh, it's done. I mean, thanks. Thank you very much. Everything has been done.